podcast to be broadcast to the world and to, to reach out and touch touch many, many people. And, uh, and, and we'll, we'll just make a few brief comments Hello, and now and then to save the most of our podcast, comments for where you once you've a- actually heard the first, first part of the feel. podcast. I am your host, Rhonda I mean, Morosky, the first part of the session. I also want to thank studio, my Christian Dr. son, who was my co-therapist. He happened to attend the, 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 this particular the workshop, and, the and of the new uh, I, I like to have a, a co-therapist when I'm, when I'm teaching. Now, team therapy doesn't mean States, you have to have two therapists. Some people are confused about that. Team therapy is one David generally is one therapist and one patient or one therapist and a group of people receiving this new new type of treatment. But when I teach, it's fun to have a, another therapist to bounce ideas off of. And Mike is uh, the top uh, Canadian expert on team therapy. He teaches, he does, he does therapy uh, sessions as well, both locally where he lives, I think in the British, north of British Columbia, but he also does work for Canadians through, through the internet. So he's a good good re- resource for people. You know, Mike was w- one of the, my first teachers, actually. I took a online course with Mike Christensen and Lee Harrington. Oh, is that and, right? Yeah, I have a, I have a strong fondness in my heart for him. I find him to be incredibly compassionate and intelligent. Yes, yes. And, and one of the, the issues that will come up on the first part of the podcast, is it ever appropriate for therapists to, to share their own feelings and, and experiences in a therapy session? And, and here you'll hear Mike talk about the, uh, the, the sad death of, of, of their son. Uh, and, and, and actually, that's one of the questions I want to discuss with you when the podcast is done. Yeah. And, and then the, another question that this, this young man raised, uh, Christian, uh, is he had heard that, you, you know, there's a lot of stuff going around, kind of myths about therapy that are propagated as truths, because you have a lot of people on the road teaching, and, and, and sometimes they get a little carried away with their own importance and and what they they know, I'm I'm the delightful exception to that, of course. But it's it's just so easy to to think you know more than you know. And he had heard some experts saying that you can't treat trauma with uh, cognitive therapy or talking therapy because the trauma gets embodied in your embedded in your body, and you have to do somatic work. That and actually, that's the, one of the theories behind EMDR. Yeah. Do they do somatic work in EMDR? I know they use eye jiggling during well, exposure. Well, the eye movement back and forth helps um, release the, the the experience of the trauma, not just verbalizing it. Well, that's exposure. That's not EMDR. Uh, EMDR adds eye jiggling to exposure, but I'm, I'm not aware of any research or convincing evidence that you need the eye eye jiggling, but... But that does bring another important component is, is uh, another thing that people say you, you have to use exposure in treating trauma. That, that's another big truth that's being promoted. And then other people say, oh, you, you shouldn't use exposure because it's, it's way too dangerous. We'll comment on all these cool things once you've had a chance to, to get to know this, this wonderful woman, Sherry, and, and the, the horrible trauma that, that she experienced seeing the near near death of her husband from a massive heart attack. And, and you'll hear just how terrifying this this was to her. And it also uh, echoed her, her, her loss of her father through a, through a stroke, through a similar experience, the recent de- death of her mother. So she'd actually had a, a number of traumas, plus her own diagnosis of, of breast cancer. You know, one of the things that was interesting was the, the trauma of her own um, breast cancer experience and, and going through the, the medical interventions that she had to go through. She didn't experience that as trauma in yeah. the same way that she experienced witnessing her husband have a heart attack. Well, one of the things, I'm sorry you can't see the, the video. Maybe someday she'll let us publish the, the video too, which is extraordinarily, but you're going to see a, a really powerful woman and a very genuine woman and, and you're going to see love maybe like you've never seen it before. And, you know, she's facing her own chemotherapy and dangerous prognosis, and it means nothing to her yep. in comparison with the, the, the loss, the fear that she feels about her husband's he- health. Let, let, let's give a listen, and then we'll, we'll comment. Great. Okay, thank you, everyone, for coming to the evening session. And I, I want to thank you, Sherry, as well for uh, 
making the pretty brave decision to come up and, and, and tell us about what's been causing you a tremendous, a tremendous amount of, of anxiety. And thank you, Mike, for agreeing to be my co-therapist. The, uh, I had a couple of reasons for wanting to work with Mike as, as my co-therapist. Uh, one of the reasons is in my Tuesday training group at Stanford, and also in our online training groups, one of the teaching tools and training tools we use is live work, personal work, like we're, we're, we're doing tonight. And, and when we do that, we we're often break the group, like there might be, say, 25 at the, at the Tuesday group, and then we break into, say, five small groups in five different rooms and with a patient in each one, and then the other people act as co-therapists to practice the model and, and get feedback. So it's we're doing actual live therapy with the person who volunteers to be the patient, but at the same time, it's a, a wonderful uh, training op opportunity, too. So this will give you kind of a little feel for, for two therapists working working together as, as a team. And before tonight's session began, I asked Sherry to fill out uh, both the brief mood survey so I can, we can find out how depressed you are, how anxious, how angry, all, all these things. And then at the end of the evening, I'll, I'll ask you to fill out this uh, brief mood survey again, the after column, so we can see if there were any changes, and, and then on the back, I'm going to have you turn it over and, and rate, uh, uh, rate the, the two of us for empathy, uh, how, how warm and caring were we, did we understand you, uh, did we seem trustworthy, did we form a, a warm bond, how helpful was, was the session, and a few other things here, and you can put your, your comments at, at, at the bottom. And, and so what, what this showed was um, each person has, when we get upset, we all have our own, you might say, anatomy, the structure of our suffering. And some people get depressed, some people get anxious, some people get angry, uh, some people get guilty and ashamed, and some people have a lot of emotions in many different categories. Others have relatively pure uh, just one one kind of emotion that that's that's bothering them, and in your case, Sherry, your depression score uh, tonight, just before our session, and it, this has been true for some time as well, is zero out of twenty. So you have no depression at all, no suicidal urges at all, but your anxiety is sixteen out of twenty, and and that's in the severe range, and and you're feeling a lot of anxiety and fear and tension and, and nervousness and a, a, an extreme amount of, of, of worrying. Uh, the anger is zero. You have no violent urges. Uh, your positive feelings, while you're not depressed, your positive feelings are a little on the low side. The, this scale goes from zero to 40, and it measures not depression but happiness. Uh, how worthwhile do you feel? How uh, productive do you feel? How calm and, and, and relaxed? Uh, do you feel a connection to others? Do you feel hope? Just the positive side of things. And, and your score here was 25 on a 0 to 40. And so you feel some uh, good good feelings, but, but a lot of them are quite low. There's a lot of room for improvement, uh, especially in, you know, you would like to be feeling considerably more hopeful than you do and more encouraged, and, and you don't feel at all calm or, or relaxed, and you don't feel as worthwhile as you might, and you don't feel as good about yourself as you might, and you don't feel necessarily as connected to others as you might. And then the final scale you filled out was the relationship satisfaction with your husband. And this goes from 0 to 30. And in this scale, uh, 0 is the worst possible score. And so if you work with troubled couples, you see a lot of people with, with zeros. And a 30 is the highest possible score. <clears throat> and a 30 is a lot more unusual than a 0. Uh, a lot of people were, will report as awful of marriages uh, or with their partner, their their spouse, as awful as, as can be imagined. This one is the opposite. It's the highest, highest possible score. And then 
again, just to uh, get get people uh, booked in it, uh, and, and to see what the the issue was. Uh, Sherry, you approached me uh, early in the workshop. In fact, even before the workshop be began, uh, and, and this was something you were hoping to work through, <clears throat> then you told me, and I'm looking at the, the daily mood log that we talked about a little bit in the workshop, um, that, that in the last couple of years you, you've had a, a couple of pretty painful, traumatic uh, events that I was... Uh, Kind of shocked and sad uh, to to hear about. Uh, you 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 developed a breast cancer a, a couple years back and had to have uh, chemotherapy and, and 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 radiation, and that that was a a, a real sh shock shock to your system. Fortunately, you're doing well from a medical perspective, but then last year, your husband suddenly had had an unexpected heart attack, and that shook, shook you to the core once again, and although he's, he's doing well medically, this has caused you a lot of anxiety uh, and uh, worry and, and nervousness and, and fear, and you estimated the intensity of that from 75 to 100 percent. It, it varies between severe and, and extreme, and and, and as far as coming up for the demonstration, you're also feeling some some embarrassment uh, at 50 out of 100. But aside from those two types of negative feelings, everything else is zero. There's no hopelessness or anger or depression or or loneliness. And then the negative thoughts, and we'll probably have more that will emerge when we're working together here. Uh, the first negative thought, and a lot of these have, have to do with your husband and your relationship with, with your husband, and, and the first was, was, was he could have died, and uh, that, that one is 100%. And then he, he could still die, uh, and he might die sooner, sooner than normal. And that, that's 100%. And, and then I, I did something called the downward arrow Technique to see what what is the fear under the surface, and uh, and I said, you know, if, if that were true, that he did die sooner than normal, what would that mean to you? Why would that be be upsetting to you? What is the the worst part of that? And you had the thought, I I would be alone, and and I would I would have to to be aging alone, and and you believe that eighty percent, and and then and then. What is it about being alone and aging alone that would be particularly uh, frightening for you and, and upsetting for you? And you said, I, I, won't, I won't be able to feed myself. And that, that was 100%. 100%. Uh, and what you're referring to there is that you, you and your husband have, have both at one point converted to the Jewish religion. And, and so you uh, eat, eat kosher food. And he's kind of the, the chef, the chef in the family. And you haven't done done a lot of cooking. That's actually one of your. And I, and I hate it. I yeah, hate, I just don't hate like cooking. It. No, yeah. Hate well, yeah, we're together on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then another thought you had, and, and I'll shut up here in a moment, but just to get everyone to the same page, um, thought about being up here on stage, and you had the thought I might I might get emotional. That was sixty uh, percent. And then another thought is I might not get emotional. I might not be able to express my feelings, and, and that was 100%. And then, again, I did a downward arrow technique. Suppose you got on stage and you cried in front of your colleagues. What would that mean to you? Why would that be upsetting to you? And you said, well, my colleagues will see my vulnerability. That was 100%. And then, uh, and then what if you show your vulnerability and, and the tears flow? Well, then they'll think I'm not competent. That was 75%. And then if they think you're not competent, this is a good technique with anxiety. It's called the, the what-if technique or the downward arrow technique. And then what are you the most afraid of if they think you're, let's say, three people think you're not competent or 100 people tonight think you're not competent. Then, then what will happen? You said, oh, then I'll lose my good reputation. 
and that was, uh, believe that, 75%. And then suppose that happens, your husband dies, you can't cook, and you lose your reputation, then what are you the most afraid of? And the final thought, which I've had with many individuals I've treated with anxiety, is that I might end up a bag lady. And, and then that was 50%. And we didn't go any further than, than that skeleton structure because I didn't want you to do all of your emoting and get it all out be, before we, we began. So why don't you uh, t tell us, uh, now, now we, we, we've done te testing, right? We've done some measurement. What, what comes next? T-E-A-M, so what's the E stand for? So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask you to talk, and <clears throat> Mike and I will see if we can can empathize and show understanding and, and, and warmth and, and, and support, and then if, if we get up to where we're doing a good job with that, then we'll, we'll go into agenda setting and, and see, is there something here you want help with? We, we might bring some resistance to conscious awareness, See if we can melt the resistance away, and then and then you use some some techniques, if, some methods, if, if that seems appropriate. So the stage the stage is yours, Sherry. And again, once again, thank you so much for uh, making this real real event possible. Okay. So, uh, just a bit of the background about the breast cancer and the chemo. Which was very weird was I seemed to be able to cope and adapt and work that through for myself. I mean, yeah, sometimes I was scared I could have died and whatnot, but I had the best of treatment and everything else and, and got through that. But when this happened with him, it was far worse. Um, I just want to tell you, because this is my moment of it, um, he was outside power shoveling snow. And... Uh, <laughs> Have that in your hands. <laughs> Already. <laughs> Pull yourself together. <laughs> the hell with that. <laughs> anyway, he, he let, let, let comes the tears in, flow. He comes in and he says to me, mm -hmm. I'm having this pain up here. And I'm like, oh dear. And he sits down. He gets a cup of coffee and he sits down in the chair. And, he, and he's sitting there and he says, it's probably heartburn. And he says, uh, oh, I'll go take some Tums or whatever. And, and I said, well, I think I'm going to call our, our health line and see what should I do, because maybe it's something worse. And then he starts... Where saying, was the chest pain, did you say? Up here. Mm -hmm. And then he starts saying... Right in the middle. Oops, yeah, sorry, sort of across. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he starts saying, um, well, I'm having this pain in my jaw and my ears and all this. And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound right. So I work out of mm -hmm. a medical clinic. So I said, well, let me take you to the clinic. Well, okay, I would do that. Instead, he heads upstairs... And he lies down in the bed, and he, sa he says, oh, I'm just going to lie down and have a rest. And, and, and I followed him, and then he's writhing all over the bed in pain. I said, how oh. about this? How about mm. this? I'm calling him. Mm. So I called 911. So, and they came within five minutes. They were very good. But, but the, the images that I get, and what, which freak me out the most, is he, he, he was lying in the bed, and he's turning, he, first he turned gray, his oh. face. I mean... And then he turns white, and I'm like, oh, my God, he's going to die. I mean, oh. so, I thought, <laughs> so I'm freaking out. And then, you know, they shot him with meds and heart things and all the stuff they're doing. And then they had to get him down back downstairs to the ambulance. And this just was awful, too, because they wouldn't put him in a chair, but they decided, like, he's tall, right? Not fat, he's tall, but they decided they would take him down on one of these sling things. It's, it's like a beached whale. It's like a dead whale, and I'm just, oh, you know. Mm. So, so all of that sort of sits there all the time, and I just uh. worry all the time about him. Like, it's better than it was because the dog said he's got a clean bill of health a year later. But, you know, I would, if he was at home, I'd phone him 15 times from work. Are you all right? Did you take your pills? Blah, 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 you know. If I'm in bed with him, I'll put my hand on his back and I'll, you know, I want to see that he's breathing, like he's driving me nuts. <laughs> you know, mm. it is lessened, but it's still more than I want. You know? mm. So that's sort of the story. How long have the two of you been married? Eleven years, almost eleven. Eleven, 11 years. Eleven. 
It sounds like your second marriage. We got married later anyway. It sound, it sounds like you found your soulmate. <laughs> oh, don't sit down. It's going to start again. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is annoying. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned er earlier that uh, you were uh, a little concerned about, you know, showing your vulnerability, which you're, you're doing right now. What what is this like for you? Just it's, it's not as bad as I thought. Mm -hmm. you know? There isn't as many people as there was today. Yeah. So that's good. That's what happens. Yeah. You know, everybody cries. I mean, sometimes, so, so what? I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, I'm really taken by your story and just listening to you talk about your, your husband and um, the situation, you know, with your breast cancer, you were able to cope and, and it was all right and you, you made it through. And, but then when there was that day when he was out shoveling snow and it seemed so much worse with him, it kind of really freaked you out mm -hmm. that day. Um, he came in and said he was having this pain and he thought, well, it's just heartburn or something and I'll have a coffee and maybe take some Tums and, but you sensed there was something more. It didn't seem right. Well, he, he just, he kind of minimized things, and I wasn't uh, ready to do, I wasn't going to do that. I wanted to, wanted to check it out check and it up, yeah. make sure. Yeah. It sounds like you have um, an, an incredible kind of bond between you. You yeah. really care about him immensely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you thought you would call the health line, and, and he said, no, no, I'll just have a rest. And then he was getting this pain in his jaw and in his ear, and, and when he went upstairs, um, you, you went to check on him. He was writhing in, in no, I pain. Followed him. You followed I him. followed him right up there. When, I, uh, I was too scared to leave him alone by then because I thought this something's is good. Yes. Not, not good. And um, he says, yeah, it's not, it's not good at all. It was, in fact, it was awful, and he was writhing, writhing in pain, and, and you called nine one one. And were you in a lot of panic at that time, or um, when you know what was really weird? I was so calm when 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 I was calling. Mm -hmm. I work in a medical clinic. I told you that I work out of medical. So I'm around medical do and doctors and stuff yeah. a lot. I've worked in hospitals, so I was calm then. Yeah, you know when I kind of fell apart was was later on. And uh, my friends, the neighbors all came over because they saw the fire truck and the ambulance and they were hugging me. I was, that was when I fell apart, oh. after the ambulance came. Mm -hmm. Was he still inside then or, or had they yeah, taken yeah, him they to the... Yeah, they kind of said they needed to do a few things to prepare him so they, oh. it was kind of the hint for me to go, go oh, I see. out. And I was downstairs and the friends came at the front door and, you know, and then I lost it because I was mm -hmm. telling them what was going on, you know. But I was calm enough to get through the emergency part and make, well, the decision I made, when we got to the hospital, they said I saved his life, which is part of the problem. I mean, it's, it's really good, but it's also part of my problem. I know that. Yeah, your, yeah. your worrying uh, is causing you tremendous distress. That's what you're asking for help with, and yet at the same time, your worrying saved his life. Well, yeah. The life yeah. of the person yeah. you love the most. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I'm kind of caught between this. Do I still keep worrying? Do I still ask him five times a day, did you take your pill? Sometimes he does forget, so that's helpful. Say that again. Sometimes he does forget his pills. So oh, yeah. It's helpful to ask yeah. him, you know. Um, I interrupted you, Mike. You were doing beautifully. Yeah. No, that was, that was nice to hear a little bit more, get some clarity on that. And the, the thing that, um, kind of really hit me was when you were talking about the images and how awful that is. Yeah. The, yeah. the gray face, and then it, it turned to white, and you're thinking he's, he's well, going to die. I saw my father die. He died of a stroke, and I was with him. I, I, I kind of forgot to say this, but I, I was with him. The whole family was there, and he turned like that. So, 
that's how come I thought that. He had this was your brother? My father. Oh, your father. Yeah. Oh, my he goodness. He died in 2010, and I saw him. Oh. And he, he died of a stroke. So that same, that gr- same gray and then white, and, and yeah. he did die. So that didn't help with that Just experience. Yeah. And brought that all back right in that, that yeah. moment. And yeah. Then, yeah. So, so here it is again. And, right. and now you live with this kind of constantly having to... And check on him and yeah, see if exactly. he's see if he's there and check with his medication yeah. and and he's so good about it you know he's I said don't I'm not driving you crazy I'm driving myself crazy and he says you know this this maybe is very interesting he says if you would stop then maybe I'd think well, well do you care so he's reinforcing and enabling right. me to worry even more yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Not unkindly, but you know, it it does. Sounds like he he takes such great care of him that he's kind of enjoying that. Well, he probably likes that I care. Why wouldn't he? He's my husband. You know, he's like, yeah. So once or twice he did kind of beak off a bit about. Yes, I took my pills. How much does (laughs) that ask me? (laughs) Right, and then we laugh. But you know, you you said now that you worry all the time. Lots and lots. Yeah, constantly. Constantly there. There's like I said, it was less since his dog gave him a clean bill of health a year later, so it's reduced somewhat. Which is how come I put yeah. seventy five to hundred rather than actually a hundred all the time. There's some moments of relief, but at the same time, exactly, it's still when it's when it's there, it's intense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How how were how, how were Mike and I doing in terms of showing support and warmth and, and understanding of what you've been going through. Yeah, I think you're hearing what, I, what I'm saying, how awful it was. I want you to know how awful it was, and mm-hmm. I think you're hearing that. Let's talk a little bit oh. more mm-hmm. about that that aspect, and, and there were a couple aspects of, of, of the awfulness at, at the time that it occurred. One thing, when you began to talk about him turning gray and turning white and writhing and pain, and, and then you suddenly called the emergency medical people to come, and and you can talk more about that awful piece and what that was like and what the images were in your mind. And then also how, how you f- then fell apart when the neighbors came and expressed love and warmth and, and concern and, and support for you. To bring, bring that oh, okay. out and yeah. tell us more yeah. about your, your fears of losing him and, okay. and, and how awful that is. Because I read these thoughts, but I was just reading sentences from a piece of paper and behind this fear of losing him is, is you know, some oh, pretty okay. profound feelings. Well, yeah, well, because I lost my dad that way, I told you. My mother, well, actually, adding on to all of this, mm-hmm. it's been a great few years, I'll tell you. My mother died three months after my father, and also mm-hmm. the family was with her as well. So I've seen, you know, I'd seen two people very close to me die already. Okay, so I'm sitting there, and when I, when I, um, when I when I called the ambulance, she had, she said to me if she wanted me to stay on the phone. The dispatcher, I said, yeah, please stay on the phone. I'm a wreck, right? She told me to give him four baby aspirins, which I did, and everything, you know. But of course, I didn't know what to do else for him, you know. I, I, what do you do? Someone's having a heart attack. You don't have the skills. You don't know what to do. So there was this helplessness there. Mm-hmm. And and that's where the, he could have died, and I couldn't do anything for him. And that was the problem when they when I when you know when I saw him coming down the stairs in that beached whale thing. I think that's that's even worse than that's the worst of everything. That I have that all I can see it now. He just oh you think that's it? And then I thought there's this long tunnel of aloneness. Just a dark aloneness without him, you know. And I'm not, it's not like I'm dependent on, well, I am for cooking, but you know what I mean? That was funny. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Usually I'm the one who says that. (laughs) But but it was just that companionship. Mm. We just do so much stuff together, and we have so much fun. And we like the same stuff, like the nature and the outdoors and stuff, camping and stuff. And I'm like, who am I going to do all this with? Because a lot of my friends, they don't, they don't do that stuff. They don't like that. So mm. that was this, this. It felt like this tunnel, dark tunnel that I was just had no control, like a conveyor belt going down. 
Mm. Down, down, down into this horrible. Were you standing up the top of the stairs watching them bring him down? I or were you at the bottom I was watching standing below him. Below, and they and were they, carrying him down. he was coming, and I was just off to the side, yeah. and I could see this coming down on me, like, yeah. And um, it sounds like you had both, and have today as well, both the blessing and the curse of a wonderful, loving relationship. Yeah, well, well, it's wonderful. Yeah, of course it's wonderful. But then you've got this worry because you don't want to lose. I don't want to lose it. Yeah. Of course I don't. Yeah. You know. It's it's probably a, a poor and dis distasteful analogy, but uh, you know I used to be a, a dog person, and and then we had a Samoyed. It was a gift from my wife. I think for my fortieth birthday, if I remember correctly, or something like that. She bought me this Samoyed. She knew I liked Samoyeds and. Salty became my, my best buddy, and when we moved to California from Pennsylvania, when we moved home, so to speak, and we brought him along, and of course, as well as our cats, and then uh, and he got colon cancer and, and, and died, and, and that was very sad. And then my wife kind of converted me to a cat person, and... Uh, and we, we adopted these two little ones before the ones we have now at the, at the pound. They were just five weeks old and uh, happy and popcorn and happy became my wife's glommed onto both of us, but especially her and popcorn glommed onto me. And we just loved each other and he was with me every minute of every day. Even he would sit at the, at the computer with me and kind of help me do my, my typing. <laughs> and when I'd, yeah, go in and take a poop, he'd come in and sit on my shoulder. I mean, Lovely. that's pure love. We didn't think <laughs> we needed to hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> but we used to go out in the backyard and, um, it was just, it was just so joyful to, to, to be with him. And I used to say, you know, uh, popcorn, one of us will die before the other one. And I don't know who. I don't know if I'll die before you or if you were going to die before before me. But I do want you to know that this is all we've got right now. And we've got to really enjoy this moment. And he seemed to really understand that. And it was just the most loving re relationship. And then I told him, I said, if, if you die first, I'll, I'll never let you suffer. And, and he seemed to understand that. And then the next year, it turned out he had an inherited cardiac abnormality and and required a heart transplant. And there wasn't such a thing for cats. Oh my God, yes. And uh, he started throwing emboli, painful emboli, into his feet and stuff. And so we had to give him uh, shots to a blood, blood thinner and then vets. So we kept him alive. He had six pretty good months. And then... He finally went into cardiac respiratory failure, and I brought him to the vet. I said, I'm not going to let you suffer. I love you so much, and took him to the vet and held him in my arms, and, and he, he was getting to where he couldn't hardly breathe, and he kept purring with his last breath, saying, Daddy, I love you, and you know, thank you for giving me, giving me such a good life, and then we had them give him a shot, and he, he, he died in my arms, and the, tear, the tears were flowing, but that... You know that you're lucky to have someone you love so much. I, my admiration for you is, is 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 fantastic. But then the downside of it, you're you're saying, but but I could lose this man who I love, my partner, the person I have fun with, the person I go camp camping with, and it's kind of uh, on the one hand, I, I guess it's terrifying for you more than feeling sadness and, and loss. Kind but, of both, yeah. both of those things, yeah. Because I know I would be so sad. And, and yeah, scared. Well, scared about the losing and then the sadness afterwards. Who wants to sit and feel sad all the time? I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Because I would, yeah. Now what? We're done now. That's it. I'm done. I emoted and I'm, I'm done. I'm just, just, just making a goofy comment. You made one, so I, I, I was okay. entitled to one or two. Okay. Uh, but I, how, how are we yes. doing coming across? How are you feeling in terms of feeling supported well, and understood? Yeah, I feel good. You guys are both gentle. Mm -hmm. You're not in my face or anything like that. You're listening. I like what you said about 
um, the dog and the cat and that because yeah, I love animals too. And, yeah. you know, some people, when they lose animals, they say it's family dying. I yeah. understand that. Yeah. You know, uh, not just an animal. There's yeah, there's, there. They're so loving yeah. and vulnerable. Yeah. yeah. So you understand close bonds with whatever being it is. Yeah. yeah. Is there any part that we haven't done? You said that there was, you wanted to make sure we understood just how intense the fear was. And yeah, well, unless you've been there, when, when some, maybe you have, I don't know, but with somebody that could die right in front of you that you love so much, you, you know, I don't know if you totally understand it, but, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you're, you're at least saying things that show you, you have some feelings that are in common to it. I guess that's, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I um, really kind of touched a chord with me on this one, that the helplessness. Okay, yeah. Yeah, in that moment, I um, had an experience where my wife and I lost a child, and, Mm. and yeah, you, you just feel like, you want to do so much, and yet you, your hands are kind of tied there. And, and as as passionate as you are, it doesn't seem to be enough. Yeah, yeah, like love is not enough. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and all those rushing of, you know, what are the things I'm going to miss out on, and what are the things that. You know, that tunnel that you talked about, yeah. that made complete sense to you know me. What that's like, yeah. And I, okay. I felt really close to you at that moment when you said you were helpless. It right. really resonated with me. And um, I just have a ton of admiration for you as well. And, and, and for your husband, I, I kind of feel like, well, he's the kind of guy I, I'd like to be a friend. You'd like with. to be a friend. You would like to be a friend. Thank you. That must, that's big for you to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good self-disclosure, I'll tell you. Yeah. Sometimes it really works, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder if there's kind of anything else that David and I are missing out on, or how are we doing? Good. I'm. I'm, com- I'm much more comfortable than I thought I'd ever be. Mm-hmm. Why? Why is that? Well, first of all, these guys are all very quiet, and they're kind of a blur. So, and I'm not really looking at any one person except you. You're smiling. That's fine. But <laughs> go for it. But um, so it's not my focus right now. I'm kind of more into what what am I doing? What are you guys doing? So that's yeah. not as nervous as I thought. It ex- I experience that a lot when I'm doing live demonstrations. I alluded to it this point. It's like there, there's this bubble uh, around us here. Yeah, yeah. And we have, have this, uh, you know, safe zone. We'll, we'll go outside the bubble later on if we like. But, sure, but sure. right, right now, it, you know, it does feel, it does feel very close and. Uh, I'm kind of envious of you, really. It's an odd thing to say uh, that that uh, I think anyone should should be, uh, because your suffering is such an expression of of your of your pure love. Sure. Now, um, I have a a question for you. Uh, we're just kind of tr- trying to c- connect with you and what, what you've been through as, as best we can. So I like having a co-therapist, by the way. What a beautiful job that, mm-hmm. that uh, Mike, Mike has done. And sometimes I think it's kind of like one plus one equals three or something. I think it's important. I'm probably babbling and wasting time now, but if you're using co-therapists, I think it's crucial that the two therapists really like each other and support each, each other. Uh, they do. <laughs> yeah, right. right. But if you if you've got that, you get a tremendous amount of power, uh, therapeutic power. And my question for you is, you know, we, we'd like to do more than than just uh, venting and, and supporting you. And we, we've got some some wonderful tools to address some of your fears and concerns. But I was I was wondering. 
you know, is, is would this be a good time for us to to roll up our sleeves and begin to to look at changing some of this, or do you need more time to talk and and get support? Because I don't want to jump in there and throw help at you if, if you're not if you're not ready for that. No, well, you know, I've talked about this a lot with friends and everybody, so I think I'm ready. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of talking about it okay. and worrying to people about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is fine. Okay. Now let let me ask you another question. Uh, you've been so beautiful and so gracious to to open up tonight and to to, to let us and to give us this this opportunity. And suppose that uh, that a kind of miracle happens here tonight. And at, at the end of the evening, you you walk out of out of this uh, workshop. Saying that 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 was just a fabulous uh, and, and healing and helpful experience for me. Uh, it was kind of like beyond belief for something like that. What what miracle would happen? I, it's not that I can't I can't guarantee that a miracle will happen. Although I, I believe it, it probably is going to happen. But what would the miracle be? Like what would you ask for? Well. That I wouldn't have to be worrying and stewing and all these things, and he wouldn't die. Okay. If I stop worrying, he, he, it's not that he would die. He would still live and be healthy, and I didn't have to worry. Okay. That would be a miracle. So, so, so you'd, you'd want to, to be able to give up the worrying without feeling like that, that, that the worrying is keeping him alive, and, and that if you stop yeah, worrying, exactly. some t- terrible thing will, 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 will happen. Um, Can I just say, it is magical thing, I know that. If, I'm going to jump in the head. Well, you've heard a lot yeah, about it already. But the problem is, it was real. Because they, they at the hospital said, you saved his life. So it's not, it's magical, but it isn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, um, let me tell you the good news and the bad news here. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the good news is, is that if you want, we probably can make this, this worrying uh, disappear. Um, the bad news is that we can't guarantee that your husband isn't isn't going to die. In fact, I can guarantee that he is going to die. Yeah. Yeah. At some at some point before you or or after you. Uh, so the question is, if 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 we could help you reduce or eliminate the worrying, uh, <clears throat> is that something you you would want? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just it's draining. Uh, I see. So if there's a magic button here, right here, and you, you press that right now, you'll be instantly cured, and all your worrying will disappear, your embarrassment will disappear, and you'll stop believing all these negative thoughts. Would you press that magic button? Uh, yes. Um, but I'd still want to tell him to take his pills, because he does forget sometimes. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit of worrying, but not nearly as much as I'm doing now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you'd want to reduce this uh, totally. a, a great yeah, a great deal, but not make it go all the way to zero. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that that sounds really really good, and we'll we'll see if we can bring that about in, in just in just a few minutes. But 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 before we do that. <clears throat> let, let's let's just make a, a brief list. It won't be real extensive, but you know some of the answers already. But let, let's just put it on a piece of paper. What, what are what are some of the benefits of of, of of this worrying and and some of these these negative thoughts? That's that's one question. And the second question is, what is the worrying? What are the the, the negative thoughts and worrying show about you and the embarrassment that you're feeling? What do these things show about you that's kind of uh, beautiful and awesome? So we have two okay. kind of frames of reference to, to dip into here. Okay. So, so the benefits, like I say, if, if, I, if I do tell him to take his pills, he, he'll remember to take them. Okay. Because, okay? I mean, everybody forgets their pills once in a while. Even I do, even I did. But, um, so he'll take them. If I tell him, that's one of the benefits, and that's he's on heart meds that keep will keep him healthier. So okay, he needs so to do that. that's a good one. So let's put that down as number one. He, How would you word he that? Will, he will take his pills. Yeah, he will take his pills. Take his pills. 
if I worry and remind him. If I, yes. Yeah. yeah. And that, uh, and that, that, that's huge and that, that's real. But what are some other uh, ben benefits of uh, worrying? And what, what also do, does your worrying show about you that's, that's beautiful and awesome? Well, I, I, I always harpen at him to, oh, I should have told him tonight, do your treadmill exercise. You've got to exercise, go for a walk, do your weights. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, it's the same kind of deal as take your pills. Sure. Because, but I, I think that also shows that I care about his health. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's one of these. But let's put, put it over, over here. Um, like if I'm worrying about him, I'm caring about him. Uh, it shows that, that, I, that I care uh, about him. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my worrying is an expression of my love. Yes. Uh -huh. Is that true? Yes, and he sees it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's not bad. The, the love part isn't bad. No, and that's, that's, awesome. what, that's what your worrying is. It's, it's an expression of, of your love, and that's, that's real. What, what are some other uh, benefits here? On the one hand, you'll remind him to exercise, to take his pills. Your, your worrying shows your, your tremendous uh, dedication and, and, and love for him. What, what are some other good things about these negative thought, thoughts and feelings? Well, just the alertness mm -hmm. of the hypervigilant and stuff. If something should go wrong, uh, and I, I, I've been hypervigilant or watching yeah. or always connected to them, then I can phone 911 again. Okay, but that, that's huge. Yeah. The, the hypervigilance yeah. uh, will keep me alert to call 911 yeah. if the need is there. Yeah. And I mean, a bigger one of that is again save his life. Yeah, and, and sure, and save life. save his life. Yeah. Now, um, um, uh, a, a lot of your negative thoughts have to do with you, if he dies, you'll you'll be all alone, you'll age alone, you won't be able to feed yourself, and that kind of funny in a way. Well, you, it you is know. really funny. But uh, <laughs> what what does it show about you that's really beautiful? About not cooking. Uh, well, uh, you're you're saying. If I lose this man, he cooks for me. We have this kind of symbiotic relationship. Oh, I'm very bonded to him. Children Is that a good thing? Yes, yes. Put put that down. I'm I'm, yes. I'm very I'm very bonded to him. Yeah. Uh, so so that's 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 a special uh, r relationship. Uh, as opposed to saying, well, he cooks for me, but if he dies, I can go out to dinner. Grab oh, a yeah. McDonald's. You see, you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that it, it's it's showing showing your love. Now you've also said, and you can jump in here and interrupt me, Mike. Uh, but um, you're afraid that um, if you cry, they're going to th think that you're not competent, and they're going to judge you, and you're going to lose your your reputation, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> end up a bag lady. What are those thoughts to show about you that's that's kind of beautiful and awesome? Well, I really care about my work. Oh, is that I true? I really do, yes. And, and do. does that motivate you to do good work? Yeah. What do you think I'm here for in this workshop? Yeah. Oh, I want to learn new stuff. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I, I really care about my work. <laughs> my, my, my work. Um, I, 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 w I want to learn new things. Yeah. Uh, I want to, to learn new things. Now, uh, you kind of mentioned about your your reputation. I think it's well. good. I've been told good things by clients and colleagues, so that's important to me. So, is that one of the, the benefits then of, of a little bit of worries? You, you can retain your. Oh great yeah. Reputation. If I'm doing something. If I have a, like a, not a great therapy session, I do do about it a bit. Yeah. Uh, so you, you <laughs> Which well, hopefully that'll lead to new learning rather than just. It's painful, yeah. isn't it? Oh, I hate it. Yeah, I hate it too. I hate it. Yeah. I hate it in a workshop too. <laughs> Even worse. Yeah. yeah this has happened today to some extent. So it seems we'll get like... into that tomorrow. Okay. But uh, okay. the uh, but you're you're afraid these people are going to kind of judge you and you're going to lose your reputation. What does what does that show about uh, how how you feel about these people? 
Well, I care. I care what they think. Is that know? true? Yeah, they're all intelligent people. They're professionals. So, so, so I care about that. that, uh, that you know, so put yeah. that down. I, I care about the people in the workshop, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, I, but I don't want them to be bored. Uh huh. Yeah. Sure. But you also want them to see you in a positive light, so you can feel close to them, right? Have good relationships with them. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, some I'll never see again, right? But mm -hmm. but it's like, okay, there were some. Col I don't know if they're here now. But there's some colleagues that are actually with an agency that refers to me, not them specifically, and I thought, well, I don't want them to think poorly. Yeah. Yeah, because then what if I don't get referrals? That's, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I care about what those two thought, but I don't think they're here. <laughs> just, just, oh, okay. But it sounds like you want to have uh, them to respect you, and you want to, to respect them. And yeah. Is that a good thing? Yes. And how would you, why is that a good thing? I, I like res respect for people. I believe in it. I try and do it. I don't always succeed, but put, I try. Put, put that. I, I, I want to give uh, and receive respect, right? Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Is that a good thing? Yes. Any Anything else here? And we're probably pushing harder than we need to in this particular case on all, all of the negative thoughts and feelings. But I'm just trying to illustrate kind of how, how the process works. Um, uh, can you think of any, any others here? You... Yeah, I'm just, one of the things I was wondering is you, um, you want people to kind of perceive you as competent and have a good reputation. And it, it seems like you have a pretty uh, high moral standard for the kind of work that you do. You really, yeah, I'm really big, care about big your... on ethics. You're uh, right. That ethics are really important to me. Uh, yeah, for so, my profession. So yes. Could could we? How, how would we write that down? Well, I, va I value ethics. I value my Put ethics. that down. Yeah, I value my ethics. I hadn't thought of that one, but that's that's huge, and that's really that's really a good one. Can you think of any other things that all these negative thoughts and feelings show about you that's positive? How about, oh, oh, I might end up a bag lady. What are some really good things well, about... Well, I even said that after I don't, it felt funny when I said it, but then I thought, well, that's kind of disrespectful. I could call them a homeless person. Mm -hmm. I just kind of thought, oh, no, no, they're going to think I'm disrespectful, but I didn't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. um, um, not as, as... Just the fear, again, of, of being alone on the street and... And homeless. And homeless and, and stuff, and, homeless. and how insecure that would feel. Yeah. And, and what does that show about you that's really beautiful and awesome? Can you think of something like, when I first saw that, I thought there was nothing good about that one, but now something's dawning on, on me here. So I want to take good care of myself. And, and that happened. That's it. With, that's it. Oh. But that happened with cancer, yeah, because I wanted to take care of myself through that treatment. Yeah. And I, I actually treated myself as I would one of my patients, and it sure worked. Yeah. Yeah, it worked well. So that's, that's the thing. And if, if, I'm, if I'm a homeless person on the street, it's very hard. To, I've treated some homeless people. It's very hard for too. them to take care of things. It's oh, very difficult. Oh, it's a horrible thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so take, to take care of myself. Yeah, I, I, I want to take care that's of myself. I have self-love, right? Okay. These are only half of them that are in the wrong columns, but it doesn't It matter. does. I just yeah. make one column. Okay. Uh, I, I had that split column thing at one point a few weeks ago, and I was getting real excited about how discreet and it was. But it's too from, all over the place. Yeah, yeah I just like make a list of positives, and it, it seems it seems fine. And that's all I can think of at, 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 at the moment. Um, Oh, when you say they'll think I'm not competent, I mean, we maybe hit this one already, but uh, yeah, we've already said that, 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 that you um, value hard work, the value hard yeah, work yeah, and, and doing yeah. good work and, yeah. and, and, and so forth. And so um, uh, maybe we, we don't want to press that magic button and, and make 
all, all of these, these things go away because well, on the one hand, all the worrying is, is you, you were motivated to get up on stage to get some help with it, so it's not trivial. You've been talking to friends for a long time and wanting it to go away, and it hasn't. It's been pretty persistent. It's improved a little, but it's been persistent. Um, and, uh, and then when we made a list of, of what these, the positives, I think I've got ten, ten, ten things uh, on on my on my list that this shows about you that's that, that that's really beautiful about you and and, and some real advantages. Um, d- does this seem realistic? What we're doing does this seem yeah, true? Yeah, it's, it's, huh? it's, it's weird that all of that would come out of it, all it, the positives it, that would come out of something that drives me nuts. It, isn't that interesting? <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, I never thought about all that stuff. Yeah, it's it's been it's been pretty new, pretty new for me too, and. Uh, and so then, I guess the question is, uh, may, may, as you alluded to earlier, maybe we don't want to press that magic button. Maybe mm-hmm. instead we could think of the magic dial and, and, and dial down these two emotions. Sure. Um, you, you know, how anxious and worried, nervous and frightened would you want to be tonight if we could dial it down to any any level? Maybe maybe let's say about twenty five. Twenty-five. Okay, yeah. let's put it. I don't up. want to fall asleep up here. You know? Right. Well, so that's that's right. Not that anxious. Yeah, and so we'll dial it down to twenty-five, and then how uh, embarrassed do you want to feel? That was fifty. Well, I don't. Uh, that would be zero. I don't uh, want zero. to be embarrassed. Okay. Yeah. And so let's go ahead and see if we can get rid of the embarrassment, and lower the anxiety to 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 twenty-five, and then again, if we overshoot on the anxiety, because uh, it could fall. Like yeah, okay, yeah, and I don't want it to go to, to five or ten, yeah. but we can we can work it back up to twenty five okay. uh, be, before the end of the evening because we love don't to see how that works. Yeah, well, <laughs> you just start thinking these negative thoughts again, okay, and then you All can right. dial that it be easy. dial yeah. it up to a healthy level. Oh, okay, okay, uh, and and so now we we we've really completed the the outcome resistance um, issue. On anxiety. Now, what, what, do you remember what the process resistance issue is? Yeah, not wanting to do your homework and stuff. Like well, that, or right. Other be- behaviors that you don't want to do. Yeah, and, and, and particularly for anxiety, what is the thing that not, the, wa- not, stop, not wanting to worry about what? Well, no, the thing, uh, the process resistance, and this is speculative, we'll see if we need oh, it, no, but good. would be exposure. Oh, yes, yes, yes. To, and, and what we might ask you to do is to fantasize intentionally your husband's death. Oh, shit, no way. Really? Uh, yeah. Oops, I'm not doing that. Really? Uh-huh. Uh, well, okay, I don't want to, I don't like that at all. That, I have enough of that. Uh, right. I'm supposed to really. But is, isn't that what every anxious patient says? I'm, I'm, I'm flooded with anxiety all the time. I don't want to intentionally make myself uh, anxious. Yeah, I don't like that. Um, yeah. Um, but um, as, as, as long as, as you take that position, and I know it sounds grotesque, <clears throat> it sounds unkind, but, but I would need you to be willing to, to do the exposure <clears throat> if, if we really wanted to smash, smash this, this, this system. Um, you know, I, I, to be honest, you know, I'm just thinking back on this. I haven't fantasized his actual death, but I have fantasized about him, what if he's gone? Mm-hmm. You know, like sometimes he'll come home late from work. Okay, this is what it could be like. I'm sitting here alone. What, what's for supper? Yeah, I, yeah. There's nothing, and and, and I'm not going to see his smiling yeah. face. And blah, exactly. Blah, blah. <coughs> it, that I have fantasized mm-hmm. about, but not the actual process. Yeah. Well, all of those things we'd be asking you t- tonight to intentionally fantasize with the idea of making yourself as anxious as possible for as long as possible. Oh. Yeah, okay, well, I don't, I don't, you're asking me that would I do this? Yeah, like what would it be worth to you to bring that, that miracle about? What price would you be willing to pay? No, I'm up here, I guess. I guess I'll just go with it. What's, what's the worst that can happen kind of thing? Exactly. Fall apart, it, it, so it, what? It, well, fall apart, and also the fear, well, if I get anxious, then my husband's going to die. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, that, that, you know, if I... 
worry to, to, well, or some kind of magical yeah, thing, think, thing, if I thing do, there. If, I, if I'm not mad, if that makes sense. No, it did, it did temporarily to me right too, but, it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is if I fantasize my husband die, maybe he will die or something like that. I oh, gotta I see, avoid that. I see. I gotta avoid those dangerous fantasies and keep them alive. Do you see what yeah, I mean? Yeah, that's magical, yeah, because yeah. that won't have anything to do with it. Yeah, yeah right. right. Okay, so we've done the outcome and process resistance, and I think the only <clears throat> teaching point there is that you did show some initial resistance to, to the exposure, and I think a lot of therapists might back down at that at that point. If that was me, I would. Yeah. As a therapist, I yeah. Would. yeah I would. And and I think that's also why you need empathy in a good therapeutic relationship, so the person will 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 trust you. <clears throat> and I can speak with personal experience because I've had at least seventeen different forms of anxiety that I noticed when I wrote the book, When Panic Attacks. I mean, I've had phobias up and down <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. And, and I know the, the importance of the exposure and also the importance of, of getting doing that in the presence of someone you trust who, who will support you in the process. And, and so if we do that, we'll, we'll go with you there to the, to, the gates of, to the gates of hell, so to speak. For sure. Sort of seems... A little cruel to ask at the moment, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I just, I kind of hate like, it. Wow, why, why would you ask? Yeah, I kind of hate it. Yeah, and that's why it's so critical that that we, we're together with you and, and we're going to go there with you. Yeah, I and wouldn't want to do it alone, that's for sure. Yeah. We, we wouldn't ask you to do something we, would, we wouldn't be willing to do ourselves. All right. Now, at this point, we can uh, dive into the methods, or if you folks think we could stop and take a question or two from, from the audience. Yeah, because I need a drink of water. Could you do that? Oh, oh, no water we can't do. Uh, we could, oh. uh, no, I'm just pulling your leg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Was he taping? That sounds, that sounds stupid on the tape. You'll edit it, right? Do you? I don't know. I just leave the goofy stuff in. I'm, I'm so goofy anyway. Like we might as well be real. But uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, do you folks have any questions about what we've done so far? We've done T E A testing, empathy, and and agenda agenda setting. Uh, and we can just plow, plow ahead. We're moving actually pretty pretty rapidly here, uh, although. I, I think we're going at a leisurely pace. I'm coping so far. I just don't yeah. like the other part. You're going to do. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get there. But and do you have any any questions? We'll see what. And also, if you we we may make a commercial video out of this or a teaching product for general public or for the therapist. So if you do um, ask a question, you're kind of consenting for your voice to be used in in whatever whatever we produce. But yeah. What would have happened if, when you told the story about your dog and your cat, if she said, like, that's not relevant to me, like, that, that's, that's my husband? <clears throat> that, that happens a lot, and, and um, I kind of had taken the lead from uh, Mike had done self-disclosure, which you liked, and I thought maybe I'll take a shot of, at that as well. Some, sometimes patients say, I really like it when you talk, talk, tell stories about X, Y, and Z, and, and the patient is then kind of giving you permission to, to be more open and to be more, to be more vulnerable. Uh, but as you say, then sometimes patients say, shut up, this is all about me, it's not about you, uh, that type of thing, or some equivalent statement, and then, then you, then you say, okay, this is someone for whom I'm going to be more, more other focused and not use self-disclosure. I think the important thing, if you're using self-disclosure, is, is to give the patient the message, I've been there and I can lead you out of the woods. Like if I were to say, I wrote this book on anxiety and noticed I had 17 anxiety disorders and I'm totally screwed up, uh, but maybe I can help you, <laughs> that wouldn't be a very good message. But if you're saying, I've had all these forms of anxiety, I know how you're suffering, I know how awful that is for you, and I can show you the way, the way out of the woods as well, that allows you to be vulnerable and human and, and to be professional at the same time. And most patients like that message, but as you point out, some, some will, will not, and, and then you change your, change your approach. 
Good, good question. And any others? Yes, here, here's one here. What would have you done if she was firm in her resistance? If she said, I'm not going there, I'm not going to imagine this, it's not worth it for me to have that miracle back. She's firm in that resistance, what would have you done? I didn't quite, being old and half deaf, deaf, I didn't quite get the question, but it was like you were saying initially on the process resistance, I'm not going there, I don't want to mm -hmm. do that, but I didn't get the rest of her question. So Did what you? would you have done? What would you have done if I had just said, no, I'm not doing it? Oh, yeah. well, that's a sucky spot to be in in a, in a workshop. <laughs> but in a therapy session, and hopefully in the workshop, I, I, would, I would say without the exposure, I, I can't really heal you. I can't really cure you. I've got 15 techniques that I'm going to show you that you're going to love. They're going to be very helpful. But if you want complete recovery, you know, and, and we leave something that we're afraid to look at, then you're going to be trapped, trapped in the anxiety. And so if you want me to help you with this, th this would have to be a part of, of the treatment package. And if you don't want to do that, God bless you. I totally respect that, and I would never coerce you or try to persuade you. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, you'd have to understand that without the exposure, I couldn't take on the, the treatment of, of of your anxiety because it wouldn't be it wouldn't be honest in my case. But okay, so but could you give them a choice of when that would happen? Like, say tonight, I said I just can't do it. And you were my personal therapist or whatever. But I'll do it next week with you. I'll get myself ready, like because you have an ongoing therapy. That, that, yeah, that's okay. That? Well, you yes. Yeah. I, I mean, this is an art. It's not a technical science oh, okay. with rigid that's rules. Good. And as as long as you're forming a warm bond and a trusting connection with a patient, that that's perfectly okay. The only thing you'd want to uh, look out for in that case, though, would be if you're getting into this long series of procrastination where the patient is oh, putting yeah, off no, and, no. and 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 putting off. Uh, but, but yes, in fact, I've even scheduled exposure for, you know, a week or two down the line yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and even set up a double session to do the exposure so we have plenty of time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Are there any other? Uh, yeah, yes. Hi. Um, the majority of the examples that you've given us today are to do with longstanding issues that people have had. Would there be an appropriate time for if somebody has just recently had this traumatic event? Oh, yeah. I'm going to give you a case tomorrow of a woman who's just diagnosed with terminal ovarian cancer, and I was asked to see her one week after she received the diagnosis and was, was horribly depressed. When, when the, the trauma is acute, the, it's even easier to treat. And the more horrific the trauma is, the easier the person is to treat, to treat as well. But when things are, are long-term, long-standing, that's called complex trauma, or if a person has had re repeated traumas, as you know, a lot of the people in workshops have come with childhood sexual abuse and then homelessness. I had a therapist in Seattle who had been homeless for 10 years, and she was an intravenous drug addict and a prostitute and had, had all kinds of losses. Her son had just died of a heroin overdose, and she'd had a run-in with a serial killer, and starting with sexual abuse in, in childhood and just one thing a after the next. And and sometimes, according to the experts, that, that that's more difficult to treat. Although in my own experience, those individuals with those long, complex uh, traumas have also been a joy to work with and, and, and very easy to treat in, in, a, in a single session. I, I hate to say it because it sounds so horrible to, to to make that claim, but that that's what my experience has, has been. Uh, I, I just think that working with people who have had traumas is is, is one of the best best areas, uh, the most rewarding and, and the most emotional and where you can do just such su such su such wonderful work. One, one of the reasons is that people who've had traumas often don't have a vested interest in being upset. Like in your own case, we don't know how much time you have with your husband. It could be, no it could be a day, it, it yeah. could be 25 or 35 years. God, really. Yeah, but 
for you, it would be wonderful to have joy with, with, with him and not be constantly vigilant and, and worrying. So there's some real re reward for, for, for the patient. If someone is dying of cancer, they, they don't have a vested interest in spending their precious last two years of life in some kind of depression and anxiety and, and things like, like that. And, and so to, to me, it's just a beautiful, uh, a beautiful way to work, a beautiful kind of pro problem to work with, particularly when, when you have rapid healing uh, available for, for folks. One, yeah. one last one, and then we'll, we'll carry on here. And thank you for the questions. Just to go back to when you were um, uh, giving her the option to do the uh, exposure therapy, I'm, I'm just curious as to why it was that or nothing, you know, like, cause, uh, uh, would there be no other technique or tool that might be useful to just kind of get her going a little bit? Well, I have like 10 or 15 or 20 tools I'd have on the recovery circle, downward arrow technique and, and, you know, all, all kinds of neat tools. But, and, and there's a lot of different kinds of exposure techniques. There's at least 35 cognitive exposure techniques alone to say nothing of classical exposure te techniques and interpersonal exposure techniques. But the only choice, choices, it seems to me, with regard to exposure are gradual exposure or flooding or, or avoiding it. Gradual exposure and flooding are both equally effective in research studies. You can have the person do a hierarchy of the things that they fear and then go, go up the hierarchy, that's gradual exposure, like going up a ladder one rung at a time. This week we'll go up to the first rung, next week we'll go up to the second rung, and as soon as you're over the fear at each level, you go up to the next rung. Exposure is like how I was treated in high school by the drama coach for, for my fear of heights. I, I want to be on the, the stage crew for Brigadoon, and so I get something, they said I had to get extracurricular activities to get into a good college. So I thought, well, if I'm the stage crew of Brigadoon, I get into Harvard or something like that. You know? <laughs> so, but the, state, the, the drama teacher said, we can't have you if you have the fear of heights. <clears throat> so I said, well, I have the fear of heights. I think I inherited from my mother. Uh, and he said, well, unless you'd be willing to get over it, you can't be on the stage crew of Brigadoon. And I said, I'd be willing to get over it. And he said, would you like to right now? I said, yes. Yeah. So he had me stand on the top of a tall ladder, an 18-foot ladder, right on the top rung. <clears throat> and then he just stood on the bottom. And, and, and he said, uh, you know, just stand there until you're cured. Oh. And I was like 100% panic. I said, shouldn't I say some special words or do something? Uh, I'm 100% panicky, Mr. Krishak. And he says, no, David, just stand there and let me know when you're cured. I'll just stand here and wait. And then after 15 minutes, I said, Mr. Krishak, it's still on the 100 out of 100. He said, that's okay, Dave. It'll just suddenly break. Just just stand there until you're cured. Then about a minute and a half later, over a 15-second period, my, my fear of heights went from 100 to zero. And I said, Mr. Krishak, I'm not afraid anymore. I, I, I'm cured. He says, get down off the ladder. You can be on the stage crew of Brigadoon, and the rest is history. I, I never went to Harvard, however. But that's called flooding, and I kind of prefer flooding. Now, we might do some flooding here tonight in terms of fear of how you people are, are, are judging Sherry, but we'll come to the, the exposure later. But I think those, those are your choices is gradual exposure or, or, or flooding. But, but you can be, be with the patient. I've gone with patients, you know, to, in, to dangerous places that were dangerous to them to help them help them get, o get over their fears. The, their relationship, I think, is very important. I trusted Mr. Krishak. I felt that what he was saying was true and that, that he would make sure I was okay, and that gave me the courage to stand on that ladder for about 16, 16 minutes. One of the problems, if you, if you avoid the exposures, you're, you're sending a message that the, the, the thoughts and the fears are, are valid, right? The, underlying thoughts and anxiety or something terrible is going to happen and I won't be able to handle it. And That's so now, right. Now when you, if you, if you avoid taking them to exposure, you're telling them, yes, those messages are true. And, and I'm so, afraid too. And, and I'm afraid too. And so it, in some senses, for me, it's, it's almost a little bit unethical not to take them there because I'm actually feeding those negative thoughts. 
by not taking them to exposure. Right, right. So, Rhonda, let's uh, talk about what just happened. We'll um, be a little quick because people have been patient to listen to this podcast for, for quite a while. But we've got a few really cool things to add here, and then we'll break off uh, uh, and, uh, and continue with the, the dramatic end of the session ne- next, next week. Okay. Um, I just want to first say how moving it was to listen to her story and how beautiful it was for her to get through the positive reframe. I loved that. Um, in the beginning... Some of my questions are really about the therapeutic process that you went through with her. And the first question I had, you know, after about 21 minutes, you asked Sherry how you and Mike were doing for empathy. And she seemed to give you a good enough grade, like you did, like you were fine. Um, But you continued the empathy stage. You didn't issue the invitation or start working with her. And I was wondering why you kept the the empathy phase going. Well, this is all an an, an art form, so I, I, I would have to say there's no black and white answer to your excellent question, but she did say, I want you to know how awful the, this this was. And so I took it that, that maybe we hadn't quite completely grasped just just what a horror it, it was it was for her. Mm-hmm. And so maybe she needed a little bit more time to talk and for, for us to let her bring us in, into that nightmare for, right. for, for her. So that was your cue when she said when she said that. I, she, that she hadn't discussed all of her images. Y- yeah. Um, and, you know, I could have also said to her, I mean, I just made an educated guess, really. Yeah. I mean, this is art uh, as much as it is science. But I also could have said to her, I- I'm wondering, maybe we need to take a little more time for you to let us know just how horrible it is, because I don't want to s- sell short the, how just how traumatic this this experience was for you. And then I think for our, for our listeners, too, to keep in mind that it, it's not the actual event but your thoughts about it. And so people could have extreme reactions to something that we might think is relatively not that severe and could have very minimal or no reactions to, to something that we think is extremely severe. We're all individual humans. And part of therapy is to, to get into Sherry's world so she knows that we're there witnessing w- with her what she went through and how how horrifying it was for her. Yep, exactly. And and I think this is so important for me and maybe for people who are listening because I worry that when I'm with patients myself that I'm so eager to get to the agenda setting and get to work and, you know, get to enlightenment with my patients that I I think I rush through the phase of empathy. That's a mistake I often uh, make too because I'm so eager to to do the rest of the model and to see the person change. And it's also a huge mistake that the general public makes when when you have a loved one who's upset, a son or a daughter who's been bullied or teased or did poorly in an exam, and, and, and they really want to just emote and, and have you listen and say, tell me more about that, and I feel so sad, and I can see how hurt and angry you are or how ashamed you feel. Let, let's talk some more about it. That, that's what people want to hear. But often mom or dad or, <clears throat> or a friend jump in to try to help. And that can be very uh, irritating to jump in, in prematurely. And that's, it's an error that we're all, we're all prone to make. Now, some people make the opposite error of just talking, talking endlessly without getting to the cure, to, to the, to the treatment, to, to the change. And so we're, we're trying to strike a, a healthy balance. And, and so how do you strike that healthy balance between letting the person talk until they feel complete versus, you know, encouraging them to start work? Well, it's again, it's just your, your intuition, but there's a few hints. Like you can ask the patient, am I getting an A, a B, a C in empathy? How would you grade me so far? And if the patient doesn't feel you're completely there, they might say, oh, that's a B or a B plus. And then you'd say, "Well, tell me the part, the part that I'm missing." That's that's the the call call the give me a grade technique, and it's incredibly powerful. And not one therapist in a thousand uses it, and I think all therapists should should use it to to find out how how you're doing. And then, secondly, in, in this case of trauma, ha, has Sherry cried? Has she sobbed? Ha, has, has has there been an emotional component? And I can remember things got super emotional in that first part of the session, and I think that's just very, very powerful that they, that the feelings are, are, are there. And one of the things I loved about Sherry was just how genuine and emotional she, she was and how she opened up her heart and shared what was, 
you know, profoundly personal and, and, and sensitive information. And she was scared too, because she was, she thought maybe the audience would judge her and, and, th- and think she's, think she's goofy. You can download or actually click if you're looking at the show notes. You can uh, uh, see them. Uh, I, I put her daily mood log. You can click on it in, in the part one sh- sh- show notes so you can see all of her negative thoughts. Of course, you heard them there on the podcast, too. You know, when she started crying, and I've heard you say this. You've said this to me. I've heard you say it very often. Um, when you just say, you know, that's really important. Your tears are important. Let them flow. T- tell me why you say that. Well, I just you have to have something to say, and that seems to work pretty well. But it's just to give the people the message that, you know, your tears are good. We're not here to, you know, tell you to control yourself or or, or whatever. That that uh, your 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 painful feelings. We're gonna work a miracle for you here t- today, and we're gonna do that in a few minutes. And and before we jump in and and transform everything for you, let let's let's make sure we've we've really ex- experienced this because I I think. Uh, tears can be a powerful bonding experience in therapy. They're the patient's way of saying to the therapist, I trust you. Right. Um, yep, I can see that. Well, let's talk another about another bonding experience. And, and this is when Mike Christensen disclosed his own personal terrible tragedy when he and his wife lost a child. And Mike was very warm and open. And what I, I wanted to talk to you about the goal of self-disclosure with therapists. And what I noticed... Um, that Mike do was that he he disclosed his own experience, but he did not do it in a way that he was pulling for Sherry to take care of him or feel sorry for him. And it actually had the result of bringing them closer. And Sherry even told him that was a good self-disclosure. So could you comment on that? Yeah, great. That's what Mike was doing was great therapy, not good therapy. And great therapy can't be taught for very easily. Uh, the uh, it's it's a lot of therapists are looking for formulaic therapies where you have some treatment manual and you go one two three or ACT or you know this that or the other thing is going to help the patient. But I, I think really great therapy is individualized and and part of why that worked is is that he was g- giving the message to Sherry and when you do self disclosure to give give the message. I've been there. I know the kind of suffering that, that you have, and, and I can show you the way out of the woods, that this is all about recovery t- today. That, that, that's why it was a beautiful thing. Because it, it, But if you were to say, if Mike were to have said, oh, I too have lost many loved ones, and I'm still depressed every night, and I've never recovered, that wouldn't be helpful to, to, to Sherry. That would be, that would be destructive. But I, I use a lot of self-disclosure, too. When I have an anxious patient, I, I tell them, oh, I'm so happy to be treating your anxiety, because I've had 17 anxiety disorders myself. And so whatever you have, I can show you the way out of the woods. I can show you how to recover and what a joy that's going to be. And patients like hearing that, that David is human and David is also professional and he's got the tools to cure me. You know, throughout the session you did with, you and Mike did with Sherry, you weave in a lot of stroking. Um, Before the invitation, you said you've been so gracious and kind to let us in. And you actually said very positive things to her throughout. And I was kind of wondering why you do that. Is that a way to support your patients to continue trusting you? Or is that about creating a therapeutic bond? Because I'm also concerned, when does stroking become cheerleading and ineffective? Well, that's another hugely important question, and I can't answer it very well. A positive reframing could be confused with cheerleading as well. But cheerleading, it never works. It's never helpful to to try to cheer someone up or, 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 you know, say, oh, you're, you're a good person or something like that. My stroking is not so much to try to help her get, get out of her depression or in this case, her extreme, her extreme anxiety, but to, to express my appreciation as a human being that she's up here giving a gift to a hundred people or more. And now there'll be 10,000 people at least who, who download this. This, this this podcast, and I think people like to be appreciated. I like to be appre- appreciated. Yeah, I love to be appreciated. Who doesn't? And, uh, and 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 also, when a patient who's afraid to talk, like she she was afraid, if she opened up, people would judge her. So I want to encourage her to 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 open up. So I, I mean, I learned this with with, with our cats that we, there's a stuff called cat candy. 
And if you want a cat to, to come to you or to do certain things, you reward it for, for doing that with cat, cat candy. And it, and it's very effective and, and it works with, with, with humans as well. A, a, a genuine compliment can, can be some sweets for, for the system. But if it's phony, if it sounds manipulative or like some attempt to cheer someone up, it, it's going to backfire. All of these things can backfire if they're not done skillfully. True. That's true for everything. Um, you, you, when you issued the invitation, she actually asked for an impossible miracle. When you, when she said she wished that her husband wouldn't die, which you can't make happen. And I thought you handled that very skillfully. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? No, because I can't remember what I did. But okay. since you said it was wonderful, <laughs> why don't you tell, tell people what, what Well, you I did. said they were good news. You okay. told her there was good news <laughs> that you yeah. could make her worry disappear. Yeah. But the bad news was you can guarantee that her husband would die. Yeah. And you didn't know if she was gonna, he was going to die before or after her. Um, and that was, to me, seemed like such a kind way to make the distinction between her yeah. worry about her husband's death yeah. and the, the, the impossible yeah. Right. Request that her husband not die. Right. Another thing, it's been a while since I've listened to it, uh-huh. but when I watched it, I noticed a tremendous amount of humor and laughter going on mixed in with the tears. Was that also in the first in the in the first section? Yes, it was. You know, it was so interesting that you bring that up because when I first saw the video, um, Sherry seemed so tense. I mean, yeah. her body language was tense, oh, yeah. her face was tense, and at about this point in the video, she just seemed completely relaxed. Her, you know, literally her face and her jaw started to relax, and she kind of seemed like a different person. Yeah, the miracle had had already had already but be, be, begun, and we're we're going to see if we can complete that miracle and bring her all the way to to complete recovery in the in the next uh, in the next podcast. Should we break now? And I think this would be a good time to break. Well, thank you all for putting a little extra time. Uh, the uh, I, I think you're going to love the next the next edition of this podcast too. Thank you for for listening. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank Rhonda you so much. And, thank you. And how, how do you like your new role now? Oh, I'm I'm liking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're doing great. It's just so much fun to work with you. Yeah, okay, so goodbye, everyone. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donsel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.